Well, welcome everybody. Uh, today is the first uh, colloquium for the spring series, semester series, and to ha today we have the pleasure to welcome Jit Sukumaran, who is uh, in, in the biology department and affiliated to the CSRC Center, and he's going to talk about modeling the speciation processes in species delimitation. Okay, Jit. Okay, thank you all. Thank you all for taking the time to attend this talk. Uh, thank you for having me, Jose. Um, so all the work I'm going to be talking about today is, has been done in collaboration with two other people, uh, Dr. Lacey Knowles at, in the University of Michigan, uh, Dr. Mark Holder in the University of Kansas, and of course, completely supported, a lot of the funding was supported, provided by the National Science Foundation grants to us. Um, <clears throat> provide a little bit of background on what species limitation is. Uh, and there might be some, this is not a universal definition. There are some, some varying opinions in it, but I'm going to take it as this, the identification of distinct species units in genomic data sequences using a model-based algorithm. Uh, <clears throat> So basically, it can be thought of as identifying species units. You have a collection of biological samples uh, represented by their genomes or so some sort of genomic data. So you have samples within samples. You've gone out to the field, you've collected a bunch of organisms, uh, or a museum collection, sample <coughs> genes in these organisms. And the genes and the genomic data represent those organisms. And those organisms represent populations, and you want to draw circles around them and say, this is one distinct species, this is another distinct species. Now, this has always been done. And Linnaeus uh, set up our basic classification, and, and we mapped it, biological entities to this classification based on our subjective taxonomic expertise. So there'd be people who, who knew the organisms, they understood the variation within populations, between populations, within species and between species. And based on this subjective expertise, they were able to draw lines and boundaries between species. Uh, with the introduction of phylogenetics, this did not change the process of taxonomy and classification so much. Uh, species delimitation in the traditional sense without reference to an algorithm or genomic data was still done by subjective experts and phylogenetics was used to relate these species units to each other in an evolution tree. Eventually though we start to use phylogenetics for the species identification as well as the species systematics especially in difficult cases and these were in cases where based on the observational tools we had, so often like looking at a specimen in a jar, the, uh, or just in photographs and uh, different types of data we could collect, a broad range of variety of uh, organisms had no clear breakpoints, and they were lumped together as one species nominally by the subjective experts. But when we put them in the phylogeny, we saw that there were distinct clusters. And so folks start using phylogenetics to inform the species limitation as opposed to the other way around. This is great in the sense we want our species limitation to follow evolutionary history, which is revealed by the phylogenetics. And in some way it was preferred to the subjective expert approach because it, there was, if there was a disagreement between subjective experts, uh, it was difficult to resolve is based on their intuition and, and authority often, whereas phylogenetics seem to provide a, a more objective approach. But this is a bit of a two-edged sword because it's objective in terms of you didn't require subjective expertise, but there was really no methodology to it. It involved in identifying clusters based on reciprocal monophyly, and many times speciation events occurred too recently for this reciprocal monophyly to, to emerge. Reciprocal monophyly is when you have the subtrees being of clusters being very distinct with no uh, deep coalescence going on. 
And sometimes when you sample a, a system really quite that split quite recently, we don't have that nice sorting. Uh, and furthermore, the threshold between two clusters, which we call species, was arbitrary. So there's a difference between subjectivity, which is relies on someone's personal insight, and arbitrariness, which is actually no threshold at all. And so there's no real theory informing where we drew those lines. So it is not just subjective, uh, even though you made reference to uh, phylogeny, but it's also subjective and arbitrary. So it was, in a way, a step backwards. Since then, though, since those early days, we have advanced by leaps and bounds across many different fronts, and we have brought in uh, stronger uh, statistical uh, frameworks to help us sort this out, both and biological theoretical frameworks. And the number of these, and I'm going to focus on just one class of approaches, coalescent based species limitation. Uh, Kingman, 1982, famously published, uh, in, in fact, a couple of papers that established coalescent theory as we know it today, revolutionized a number of fields, uh, including evolutionary biology. And when applied to genomic data, uh, and we, it allowed us to model the evolution of genes in populations over time. And we started to use these models to carry out statistical model-based piece limitation. So I'm going to talk about that now, coalescent-based piece limitation approaches. So I'm not, of course, going to provide everything of full details on the coalescent framework. I'm just going to provide the sort of qualitative conceptual overview as to how we use that uh, in species limitation. So coalescent theory makes predictions about the waiting times between coalescent events uh, of a sample of genes based on population size and the sample size. So coalescent events are, if we're looking at the present, at a collection of uh, genes that have been sampled from some system. And we see where those genes trace their history back to their most recent common ancestor. That's a coalescent event. We see the gene lineages coalescing into their most recent common ancestor. And eventually all the genes in a sample will coalesce to that one common ancestor of all the genes. And so coalescent events are looking backwards in time. If we look forwards in time, they're divergence event from a common ancestor with many descendants. Uh, those descendants leave more descendants and so on. Uh, and those events where a, uh, an individual uh, gives rise to two or more lineages is a divergence event uh, looking forward in time. So what coalescent theory allows us to do is to make predictions about those timings, uh, the timing between different coalescence events. And these predictions are a function of the sample size, the number of genes in your sample, and critically here, population size. The bigger the population size, the longer times we expect for those coalescent events to happen. So these, so what we can do, of course, is go out into nature, collect some individuals, collect some genes from these individuals, infer a time-calibrated phylogeny. And based on that time-calibrated phylogeny, those time-calibrated phylogenies will give us these timings, and we can use coalescent theory to predict population size. And vice versa, if we know the population size, we can predict what the phylogeny would look like uh, in terms of the timings of these events based on coalescent theory. These predictions of coalescent times have a number of assumptions. Well, the critical one here is this right fisher population. Uh, right fisher is a particular class of populations. Uh, it's a theoretical population under some uh, idealistic assumptions. And an important idealistic assumption here is this uh, panmixia, unstructured, the population is unstructured. And what that means is we can think of the population as a bag of genes. There's no structuring by distance. Uh, there's no sort of social or cultural structure. There's no barriers within that population. Uh, and statistically, that means that every, any single individual we sample at random from that population has the same probability of sharing an immediate parent with any other individual from that population. And that's, panmixia means there's absolutely no, there's no difference. There's no different change in probability that you share a parent with, with any random uh, selected individual uh, based on your distance or anything at all like that. So what this assumption lets us do is if we go out into nature 
collect some individuals, collect genes from that individual, so infer a phylogeny based on those genes, and their deviances in that measured timing of coalescence events, then what would be predicted for the population parameters as we understand them based on the coalescent, we can relate those deviances to violations of these right fisher population assumptions. Because the theoretical predictions of the coalescent are not borne out by our observed phylogeny, uh, we can say that the deviances can be numerically and quantitatively related to differences in population. Some could be population size, but what is important here is population structuring. That assumption that the population is just a bag of genes is not true. And this is the explanation for the fact that our timings diverge, uh, de deviate from that predicted. So the coalescent makes predictions for the timings to coalescence for gene sample at random. If there are restrictions to panmixia, then what happens is we would expect without, if the entire population is unstructured, we'd expect the coalescence time to be down here. But because there's a barrier that prevents the, the individuals from uh, coalescing here, it essentially pushes back their coalescent to a deeper time in the past. And that's what we will see in the observations. We'll see in a structured population the coalescence times are deeper than predicted, and we can take those deeper times to be indicative of some sort of barrier uh, in that what we have assumed to be a structured population. And that's the difference in timing. So <clears throat> to me, this is one of the most uh, beautiful theories in uh, evolutionary biology. It builds on the coalescent. It's the multi-species coalescent. And it relates these deviances in timings to structuring due to population splitting. You have an ancestral population, that's a bag of genes, that splits into two daughter populations at some point in the past, each individual being a bag of genes. And we can take our inferred phylogenies and relate it to this, relate the deviances in timings to this demographic history that's conditioning the gene evolution. They call their uh, approach mul the multi-species coalescent, and uh, this is an unfortunate term, as we shall see. They actually call it the sensor coalescent, and uh, that and in it they were referring purely to populations. Uh, a review paper later on called it the multi-species coalescent, and that has led us down to this rather uh, dangerous path. I'll cover that. So the multi-species coalescent, that's what it's popularly known as today, models extensions and timings of coalescent events as disruptions in right fissure pan mixing. It basically takes a containing tree, uh, a meta phylogeny, if you like, uh, of the population history and embeds the gene tree histories within these population tree histories. Uh, and the disruptions imposed by the population splitting condition the evolution of the gene trees that are embedded within it. So this is, imagine this is our gene tree. So these are sample of, these are genes that we have sampled from some individuals that we've sampled from the field. And we've come up with this phylogeny. And we see that these coalescent times are exactly as predicted by the coalescent theory, by Kingman's neutral coalescent. Theory. But these are deeper. Maybe we, the theory that predicted the distribution of times with an amino over here. So these deviances in coalescent times are related to, by the multi-species coalescent, to restrictions in gene flow. And essentially that implies a demographic history for the system that looks like this. Whereas these, this split over here, which follows the uh, predictions of uh, coalescent theory, uh, therefore, uh, indicate that these two genes coalesced within a bright fisher panmictic population, as the, these two. But these genes, these two genes and this gene coalesced outside of the right fisher population. It actually coalesced in an ancestral population uh, that was lit, split. And th that's what caused, we might have expected these two genes to coalesce with this gene somewhere over here, but this ancestral split 
put them into different populations, that meant they had to coalesce a much, uh, at a much earlier date. So we, I'm going to refer to this sort of meta tree as a, a containing tree. It's a tree on which the gene evolution is coalesced or not. It's the, it re represents the history of the population, in, uh, the populations in which uh, the plural is important here, in which the gene is coalescing. And we call each of these lineages. So these lineages under the multi-species coalescent actually are populations. Each of these represent a single distinct population. And these splits here are population divergence, fragmentation of a right fissure population by introduction of structure into it. Okay, so I've been talking populations a lot. How do we delimit species using this approach? Because this is the coalescent based population, the coalescent based species limitation is one of the most widespread, dominant, and successful approaches to species limitation today. So we've seen how we use the coalescent to identify disruptions in right fissure fan mix here and delimit right fissure population units. So what we do when we use the coalescent is actually identify disruptions in right fissure fan mix here, and these disruptions and relate them to right fissure population units that are implicit by, from, that arise from these disruptions. But how do we delimit species? It's simple. It's purely a linguistic operation. We interpret our populations as species. There is no statistical operation that takes us from population to species. We just go out, we sample some data, we identify our populations, and we call our population species. That is the entire basis for coalescent-based species limitation today. So is that a valid move? Is it valid to, to go out and identify populations in nature and call them species? If it is, if and only if there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between detectable populations and species in your data. Where does that one-to-one -one correspondence come from? It comes from one of two ways. One is you've gone out and collected just one sample from each population. So one population from each species. And or if by chance your species, the types of species you work with with nature, don't actually have populations, multiple populations. There's no within a species lineage structure. And there in the first, in the second case, it's possible those might exist pretty rarely. Uh, I can't think of any that are truly that way in the top of my head. Uh, in the first case, it's possible that your data might have that, uh, especially in the early days when we were very, very careful about what we picked, uh, how we, we were limited in the amount of uh, genes we could sample. But it's almost not the case for any real world data you'd be dealing with today. And what that means is the multi-species coalescent is gonna go out and give you your population units. And they would be population units. And each of those populations may come from one species, or there might be multiple populations from one species. And if you were to go out and call each one of the population units delimited by the multi-species coalescent as a species, you will be going to misclass, you're going to be misclassifying within the species population lineages as independent species. And this is what is rampant now in species limitation. Many times people working in it recognize this easily and start backtracking after the analysis and applying all these ad hoc rules and methods to try and fix the problem, band-aid patches to say, well, this can't be true and this is there. We're gonna ignore these results. A lot of hand-waving ad hoc stuff. Uh, there's these error terms you can enter, like force a particular amount of uh, time to have elapsed of a particular amount of genetic difference that should have accumulated. and. Those of you who are familiar with uh, Thomas Kuhn's uh, Structure Scientific Revolution uh, may recognize these as these uh, ad hoc things people do when they're working under severe model misspecification. Uh, your, use, your model is wrong. And the Thomas Kuhn reference is when you try to model your planetary observations with, uh, using a model that has Earth in the center of the planet's orbits, you find it's so difficult to reconcile your observations with the model and you have to add all these error terms and epicycles uh, to sort of make them all fit together and they're 
complex, unelegant, and just, and there's no real reason for them. There's no reason in your model to have them except to fix this error, a glaring error. The fundamental problem is model misspecification. And what's happening here is you're using a model of microevolution processes, the coalescent, to identify a macroevolution pattern without incorporating the macroevolution pattern in the first place, speciation. So the solution would be what happened with the medieval astronomers, move the, earth to the set, move the earth away from the center and put the sun in the center of your model, change your model. And what we need to do here to use coalescent based approaches species limitation is use a model that actually models speciation. You notice when I described the whole coalescent model of multi-species coalescent and so on, I, there was no actual speciation going on there. So how do we model speciation? So the multi-species coalescent does a great job of modeling population splitting. We need to add speciation on top of that. And this is a very attractive model, uh, speciation model to me, the protracted birth death speciation process, because it explicitly does model separately the process of population isolation or fragmentation and the development of each of the population lineages into independent species uh, later on. Uh, so model speciation extended process, uh, speciation is two separate events. The lineage splitting, which is the initial fragmentation of the population, speciation completion happens later on. And the rate of speciation completion is a parameter in that model. So this is how that process works. We have, so this is a population tree, uh, a tree where the lineages represent population units. And lineage splitting, splitting events on this tree represent population uh, the isolation of a, an ancestral population fragmenting into two isolated daughter populations. So they're new population splitting event, lineage birth events. And population lineages themselves may continue to split. Uh, and sometimes they might go extinct. They might go extinct because they get wiped out, local extirpation. Or what's implied by an extinction event here is possible loss of a barrier. That's so you can see over here, an ancestral population split into two daughter populations. But a barrier or whatever caused that split may have disappeared, causing this population to merge back into its ancestral population, uh, ending its effectively ending its independent status. Now, each of these individual populations may evolve into an independent species. And that's what's represented by these blue tick marks over here. So we can see a split occurred here and a speciation event happened here. And this is a black box right now. This, we, we, we're not say, talking about what biological processes go on into the speciation event, suffice to say that at this point in time, some biological changes occurred in this lineage that made it say reproductively isolated from this uh, lineage, if that's an important part of your species concept. All this means is something happened here to make a taxonomist go, oh, this is a different species. And so what does it mean to have a species here? An independent species then is simply Population lineages, a collection of population lineages between which there are no species completion events, but between them and everyone else, there's a speciation completion event. So we see between A and B, there's no speciation barrier separating them. So they constitute an distinct species unto themselves. At the same time, there's a barrier separating them from every other lineage and tree. There's a barrier over here separating them from C. There's a barrier here separating them from everyone else. So A and B are a distinct species, and, and to be more uh, precise, there are two populations in, the, in a particular species. C is a single population species in this sample set. D and E are two populations within a third species, and F and G are uh, two populations of the fourth species. They are both populations, different populations. They're isolated from each other, but essentially they're the same species, but they're also separated by speciation completion events from everyone else. So delineate takes the multi-species coalescent, delineates the, sorry, the uh, approach to species limitation, incorporating speciation that myself, uh, Dr. Lacey and also Dr. Mark Holder have been working on, takes this speciation process and puts it into the multi-species coalescent. It incorporates a simplified protracted birth that speciation process. Simplified, we, we take away the some of the parameters, we collapse them to be the same, the, the difference in giving rise to uh, 
new population, the rate of new population lineages emerging from species versus from uh, uh, sentient species, same, we have the same extinction rate and so on. Essentially, it introduces just one new parameter to the multi-species closer model, the speciation completion rate, the rate at which these processes occur. <clears throat> so, in the current implementation of Delineate, uh, we work in two phases. We first run the multi-species coalescent on a set of data to organize a set of individuals into a set of populations or related by a population tree. And there's standard programs to do this, BPP and Starbase and so on. So we get our population tree. Then on top of that, we run delineate to identify our species units. Now, what delineate does is it essentially calculates the probabilities of different partitions of the leaf sets of that population tree with reference to where the leaf sets represent different organizations in the species. And it's a brute force approach now. We calculate the probability of every possible partition. And we pick the highest probability, the partition with the highest probability as a maximum likelihood estimate of the species limitation. So what do I mean by a partition of that leaf set? So this is simple basic set theory. From inset theory, as most many of you might know, uh, a partition is a particular arrangement of the elements of a set into mutually, mutually exclusive and jointly comprehensive subset, not including the empty set. And to put it simply, it's just a way of taking a set and seeing the different ways we can put all those elements into subsets. We want to include every element, we don't want to exclude any element, and we don't allow the, uh, we don't allow repeated elements, an element can belong in only one subset and we don't include the, the empty subset. So imagine, for example, you have these sets, this element, A, B, C, D. These are different partitions of A, B, C, D. We can, one partition is a subset, a single subset, where they're all there. Essentially, this subset replicates the initial set. In the opposite, we get down here, where each element is in own, its own subset. And then everything in between. For example, here we have two subsets, with A and C in one subset, and B and D in another subset. Here's another one with two subsets, but the elements are shuffled around. And these are all the different possible partitions of this four element set. So our set of elements are the populations. We have run the multi-species coalescent, which is a very, very powerful uh, model. A powerful in the sense, I mean that in a statistical sense, with very little data, it's about, it's allowed, it can squeeze a lot of information out of it and give us really quite nicely the populations in that data set. And now we want to organize it into higher level uh, subsets. So ABCD, our populations, we want to organize it at one level higher, that of species. So species limitation is taking these set of populations and organizing them into subsets where each subset corresponds to a species. And we calculate the probability for these different types of organizations uh, and each, with each organization corresponding to a particular species limitation. And the, and the organization, the, the partition with the highest probability is the species limitation we choose, uh, maximum likely species limitation. All right, so I talked about calculating probabilities of these different partitions. How do we do that? So this is getting a little mathy here. Uh, The rate of speciation, these little, the rate of these little uh, blue ticks occurring on the tree is a simple Poisson process. And so these, oops, uh, these expressions are straightforward Poisson process expressions. Given a lineage duration, a branch in that tree with a time t, a uh, rate of speciation completion of sigma, the probability of N speciation events is given by this expression, straightforward Poisson process. We can also calculate two particular events. Give what is the probability of no event occurring on that branch? And what's the probability of one or more events occurring in that branch? 
And turns out these two are all that we need to know to calculate the probability of an entry, right? So all we care about, so this notation is not complete. It's also conditional in sigma, which I'm leaving out here just for space. But we got, as long as we know that, we know the ti's for each of the trees because you've inferred the phylogeny previously. And as long as we know the uh, rate of speciation completion, then we can calculate the probability of any of these states. All of these one, two, four speciation events, like 20 speciations on the tree are given by this probability and no speciation events are given by this probability. So given our, a three population tree, the partition of AB versus C Right, so this is putting A, B into one species and C into another. So this is a, these three populations are organized into two species. What are the different ways that can arise given an evolutionary history? Well, one evolutionary history is the population split. That's a given at these times. But we have at least one speciation completion event on this branch. And I want to emphasize, even though I show a blue tick here, at least one. So we can have multiple speciation completion events. It doesn't matter to us. All they do is they serve to isolate A, B from C. And all we care about is at least one speciation event on this branch and no speciation completion events at all on these branches. We don't want A and B to, uh, to have a speciation completion event between them to us for us to arise with this organization of species. And so we can calculate this probability. Now, another way of having this happen is a speciation completion event on this branch, which is different from it happening here in the same case. And again, we can calculate this probability. Uh, of course, we can also have a speciation completion event on this branch and this branch. This is a different demographic history, this speciation history we're seeing here, and no speciation events here. And we can calculate that probability. So, any one of these can give rise to this history. And so that's what we do. We, we, the probability of this species class speciation delimitation is given by the probability of these three histories. So we can sum it up and we get the probability of this, right? It's, we can calculate these probabilities individually, each of these histories. These are the three possible ways to this thing. Any one of them can work. They're all mutually exclusive events, a mutually exclusive history, so we can just sum them up. And this can be extended to any tree of arbitrary size, any population history. For each time we, we look at our collection of species limitations, we just need to map in the speciation completion events that can are consistent with this collection of species at the end of the day, and we can calculate the probability. So summary of all of that is given your branch lengths and a speciation completion rate, we can calculate the probability of all possible partitions in a partition corresponding to a species limitation. So we can get the branch lengths when we estimate the population lineage tree from gene sequences under the traditional multi-species correlator. Well, where do we get the speciation completion rate parameter from? Where do we know how do we know the rate of speciation completion, especially if what we're asking the algorithm to do is to tell us what our species are? The answer is we get it from you. <laughs> you as the investigator. You as the uh, person who's asking the question. <clears throat> so, Delinney learns about the speed rate of speciation completion from the information you give it. This is a little bit different from the way people have done species limitation before. Before, people would come in, take the data, throw it at the algorithm, turn the crank, and get an answer at the site. To use Delinney effectively, you need to provide a little bit more information. You need to be able to, with confidence, enough that your pro the program's gonna take what you're telling it as truth, tell the program for at least some of your population lineages what your species are. So imagine we've gone out and collected these samples from different populations, these are lineages. Now we know that we're confident that this lineage over here, L11, 
belongs to species S1. We are confident that L7 and L12 are two populations sampled from the same species, which we call S5, and so on with others. What we want Delaney to tell us are about these unknowns on our population tree. Are there distinct species? Are there new species? Is this a different species from S1 or is it just S1? Is this a different species from S2 or part of S2? And so on with the others. And what Delineate does then is it first prunes off all the unknowns of that population tree. And then using the induced tree, based, tree induced by the leaf's populations, you, you do know the species assignments for, you will apply the Delineate model to estimate a speciation completion rate. And then it applies the whole model back again with the, now we have estimated the speciation completion rate. We know what that is, we're fixing it. We apply the whole thing to this whole, uh, the amount of three, calculate, we they can then calculate the prob probability of all the remaining uh, possible assignments. This can be S1, this can be S5, this can be a new species and so on, to come up with the probabilities of all the different partitions. And then we pick the partition with the highest probability as our species limitation, as our preferred species limitation. So there's this, often this idea that when we talk about species, we need to have a species concept. And, the, and this is because we, species mean different things to many people. When I start, first started working this problem, I often thought if a biologist, and I'm saying this is a biologist, could come up and tell me exactly what the species is, it'd be straightforward the model, or more straightforward anyway than it is now. And it's very difficult to get more than two biologists in a room and have them agree on a species concept, uh, especially sometimes, I was gonna say, especially they work on different systems, but very often even the difference is if you get two biologists who work on the same systems, Different systems, they may argue. Two biologists who work in the same system who disagree, they may kill each other. Uh, so there is a difference there. You may sometimes get some agreement, uh, but it's not easy. And so there's, depending on whether you work on elephants or butterflies or birds or plants or cockroaches or fungus or microbial species or viruses, very, very different species concepts arise and emerge are useful and practical. Um, some have it relatively straightforward. Uh, some groups are, I don't think there's too much. There might be dispute about what the species are, but people have a fairly straightforward definition for species in some groups. We all learn, I think, uh, even non-biologists about the biological species concept, uh, Ernst Meyer's one. Uh, and, but very quickly when we start looking at species and speciation, we realize that is a, uh, that only applies to a few limited systems in the world. And, even then, and not always. Birds, really, they work, which is what Mars background was. But the moment you start looking at other groups, that thing falls apart. Uh, coyotes uh, freely can uh, have fertile offspring with dogs. Dogs have fertile offspring with wolves. Wolves and coyotes can't mix. There's so many frogs that, that uh, completely throw the species concept out of the window. And of course, plants do it overnight. You can get uh, new species forming from two very different parents. Um, and then, then when we get to the microbial world, it just goes completely out of the window. Uh, so there, there's a lot of definition and uh, there's a lot of argument of what species concepts are. And when people ask, when the multi-species coalition was first proposed, people saw this as a victory, objective way to delimit species without arguing a species concept. And of course, that is a, an utterly false. Uh, there's still a species concept implicit in the multi-species concept when you use that to identify your species, whether or not you acknowledge it, whether or not you understand it, whether or not you know it. Uh, and the multi-species concept and useful species limitation implicitly assumes all detectable structure are species. So any risk disruption, any disruption in gene flow, not just 100%, everyone would agree probably across systems that when you get 100% disruption in gene flow, you're dealing with different species. And the ambiguity lies in these middle areas, less than 100%. Uh, 
the multi-species coalesce, and if you provided enough data to detect even a 0.0001% uh, uh, disruption in gene flow, it's going to call it different species. And so we always want data-driven results, but not data-driven in this way, right? We don't want the story to change whether uh, in diff widely different ways, whether we give it 10 genes or 100 genes or 1,000 genes. We want our story after 10 genes to get more and more reinforced. Whereas we here we get more and more finer divisions into our system as we throw more data into the mix. Uh, the multi-species coalescent is unable to model within species lineage or population structure. So th that is part of that species concept. And it's applied equally and universally to all systems from elephants to bacteria. So just like the multi-species coalescent, delineate, well, if you use delineate for uh, species limitation, you are using gene flow restrictions to determine your population boundaries. But the species concepts are implicitly given by what you tell delineate the known species are. So when you come in and tell delineate, these are my known species, it infers a tempo of speciation that is consistent with your idea of what species are in your system. And that's what gets used. So again, everyone agrees that 100% gene flow is a population and 0% gene species, and 0% zero, uh, zero gene flow species. And with the traditional multi-species coalescent alone, it treats any of these as species, as long as it can detect them. And it's delineate that actually uh, complements of takes that one step further and it incorporates a more nuanced idea of what species are based on what you know about species in your system. So <clears throat> one thing that emerges from this that I think is really exciting and for me actually the favorite part, my best, my favorite part of this uh, model is in addition to being able to identify species in nature, we start to learn about the speciation process. And it's of course no mystery, right? I mean, you model, without modeling speciation, you don't know about the speciation process. You just come up with an answer, but this, this is my pattern. Modeling the speciation process in nature allows us to learn about speciation from our models. And so there are many macroevolution studies that go in and compare diversity in different areas and they contrast it between me in different areas that might have different diversity of an organism. And they contrast this, uh, the, they ask, why are these two different areas, why do they have different diversity? And there's these, one might be because there's a higher speciation rate there. Uh, the species form more often for whatever reason. And the other is the speciation rate is more or less the same, but species go extinct less frequently. And we call this the, loosely the cradle versus the museum hypothesis. Uh, now, once we identify an area as a cradle, an area of more species, because there's a higher speciation rate, well, we can ask why is there a higher speciation rate in that area? Is it something to do with the fact that lineages, populations, that area get fragmented more often? Uh, like, I don't know how current this view is, but in the Amazon, we sometimes look at, this, there's a species pump Thing, theory going on, uh, where we have rivers changing their course often, and each time they change the course, they isolate different parts of the forest. Uh, so they, that re over time, that sort of chops up populations uh, spatial temporally in many different ways. And so we can see that as an engine to generate species through higher levels of population isolation. Alternatively, something else might be going on in the biology of that, uh, of that group in that area, either in that area itself or because some, some mutation going on in, the, in, the, in their genomes uh, that cause reproductive isolation at a higher rate. And using traditional approaches, we aren't actually able to distinguish between these two causes. The classic birth death model trees are what we use. The a process, a model that allows for this decoupling of population isolation and speciation completion allows us to do that, the PBD model. But it's been difficult to uh, analytically estimate the, uh, these rates, the speciation completion rate. 
using the limit, we can numerically estimate that rate. And so that opens up a whole new front for macroevolutionary studies, where you can go in and look at highly structured systems and ask, is there something different going on here biologically for, than in any other areas that results in a higher different species? Or is it just geographical structure alone that's uh, explaining the higher rate of species? So this, um, this approach to studying species limitation is a new approach. And it's for the first time we're actually bringing in the process of speciation into coalescent based species limitation models. But it's also a new approach in what, how we have to think about designing and constructing uh, species limitation studies. We need to include populations of known species affinity. So when we go out and sample in nature, we can't just go out and pick populations that are unknown that we want to identify as new species. And typically, this is not a problem. This is how we always do it. Very rarely, I can't think of any biologists who just go out and collect unknown samples, right? You go out and do a broad survey, collecting everything as you go along. But what often happens is there is a disconnect between people who work on population level problems and population and species level problems. And people who work on species level problems will go out and collect one or two exemplar populations of nominal species. This is, I think, a bad way to go about designing studies in general. I understand it have been done this way traditionally for, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And the more populations you sample, the less species you can sample, the lower geographical uh, scope you can do. But we cannot understand species without understanding populations. We cannot understand species without understanding how speciation without understanding how populations form. And we have to understand populations to understand how populations form. We have to sample our populations comprehensively to be able to get at that rate of population formation and from that to be able to get at that rate of speciation form, species formation. So we need to be able to get away from exemplar sampling of populations. We need to go out and do and change our thinking from being collecting at a species level and think about collecting at a population level with the species level being a higher level in the hierarchy we're hoping to fill in the black spot. I cannot tell you the number of data sets I have looked at and rejected because they have one population per species or some our 100 species, everyone is two, 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 two population, clearly exemplar, uh, population level exemplar sampling as opposed to comprehensive. And they really are just not data sets suited <laughs> in this new age of species limitation. Okay, uh, I'm gonna briefly talk about performance and results. Uh, so previously in a previous paper we published, we talked about using just the multi-species coalescent uh, to uh, infer the number of species. And we see that uh, it inflates that greatly. And there's another picture I show how well it does if we change our thinking into saying that the multi-species coalescent is not diagnosing species, it's diagnosing populations. It does a wonderful job over some very, very difficult parts of parameter space. And we fix this problem by introducing a speciation model. And we do a really good job of tracking the number of species uh, over uh, a wide, the same part of parameter space. Um, so, uh, hold on one second. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Do you have to help me with the big packet? Tanya, can you please help me that talk? Sorry about that. Uh, so we have, uh, so we have, uh, this is how well it, it gets the, uh, uh, this is how well it accurately identifies species, the spe correct species delimitation, the correct partition. And we see there's a broad range of parameter space here in which it doesn't work. <laughs> but you know, this is done deliberately. We don't want to just report in the places it works. We, we, explore a really broad range of parameter space to see where it works well and where it doesn't work. 
And uh, I guess I should explain this graph a little bit uh, better. What happens here is we have on the x-axis, the number of lineages we introduce. Uh, the, on the right side of each uh, um, tick mark are the total number of lineages and the left side are the known lineages. So we can see here, then the difference of course will be the number of unknown lineages. So in here, 7580, out of 80 population lineages, we wanted the lineage to accurately place five lineages with respect to that species and so on. And here's the proportion over, I can't remember, I think it's like maybe a hundred replicates, uh, proportion we got correct. So we see over here, and, and the colors represent the speciation completion rate. Uh, dark colors represent a really slow speciation rate. When I say slow, I'm, I mean something along the lines of 10 or 100 times slower than the population isolation rate. And while I'm using the term slow here, this is actually a realistic part of parameter space. Over here, we get speciation completion rates that are approaching one, which means a one-to-one -one populations form at the same rate species form. So this is a highly unrealistic part of uh, parameter space. And we are really encouraged to see in realistic parts of parameter space, Delineate does really well. And when we get to larger numbers of lineages, there's just more information with larger numbers of lineages, it does really, really well. Uh, over 80%, some of them actually, these are mean. So you, when you look at the full distribution, you get uh, even into the 95% ranges of correct species limitation uh, partitions being identified when we're in the realistic part of uh, parameter space. Uh, this is how the speciation completion rate performance goes. Uh, we, this is basically the same, um, uh, the line here represents the, what we'd hope the estimate to hit at the correct uh, estimation completion rate. We see there's a lot of noise, but it generally tracks it quite well. Uh, a huge amount of noise. Uh, these are the co uh, confidence bands. And what is interesting here, the, this is the same data as this, where we didn't know the speciation completion rate, right? So it's doing really well, even as it gets the speciation completion rate, a uh, not so well with a, quite a bit of noise. Uh, it so it turns out it's quite robust to errors in estimates of that speciation completion rate. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> this is available online, uh, the program. And uh, if you were to go to that website and look at it, I provide actually uh, lots of <clears throat> a much more detailed um, of introduction into how the model works and uh, with lots of little cartoons examples. And a, a full workflow is given here using a data set uh, where you go through all the different steps and um, uh, breaking it down to different populations. And, and in this data set, we do know the answer. It's based on a monograph done by, uh, by Madison et al. on a Californian beetle, Lanifa. And so he's provided the alpha taxonomy. And what we do over here is we just pretend we don't know some of the new species, uh, as well as some of the existing species, and see how well uh, uh, Delinate does in recovering that. Okay, so that's all I have for you right now. And I'm, uh, thank you for your time and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Jit. Uh, the floor is open for questions. You please unmute yourself and ask your questions. I had a question. Um, your speciation rate information, right, is based off of your sample and the known information that you tell I'm sorry, I could, is there, a, I guess, I'm not, oh, sorry, can you hear me? Uh, you keep, not very well. Not very well. Um, why don't I type it in the chat, someone else can ask a question while I'm here. Okay. Hey, Jeet, I have another question. Okay. Um, hey. I, I'm sorry, my, my video, I don't think it's working, let's see. Where am I? I don't think it's working, but um, great, great talk. Thank you. Uh, that was very informative, and I, 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 I would love to test your your program soon. Uh, one of the questions that I have is uh, how does this work 
with hybridization processes? Not at all. <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, the, the problem with it is going to be that, let me see if I can share my screen again. It's, I mean, it's just part of this general problem with phylogenetics is not dealing with the hybridization at all in any way. Uh, I mean, there's, of course, specialized approach network, phylogenetic networks are what you need to do to handle hybridization. And the problem comes over here, right, in this workflow upstream of delineate right here. Basically, if your hybridization is, needs to be handled at this level, where we infer the population tree under the multi-species coalescent. If you can handle hybridization here, I mean, it won't under existing implementations. The problem is already solved before we get to the delineate. And then after that, we just map speciation on top of that. The issue is we don't have, as far as I know, a way to handle this uh, with the multi-species. I mean, I know there are multi-species coalescent extensions that allow for gene flow, but I don't know if they handle hybridization. Uh, but the issue is that problem has to be solved upstream before we get to delineate. Delineate essentially just adds the speciation process onto the multi-species coalescent. Uh, and as long as we can't infer a multi-species coalescent population tree with hybridization, delineate can't handle it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. We, I know that's a big problem, but uh, more work for everyone. <laughs> Keep slipping, yep. Uh, so Chris is asking, the speciation rate is estimated from the sample and the information provided to the model. It seems possible from the estimate to be biased. Uh, so yes, you are correct. Uh, it's, um, here's the thing though. I don't think that's a bad thing. You know, bias, I know is a dirty word, but in the world of Bayesian statistics, it has another term, it's called the prior. And it is an important thing. It is, it is a useful thing. I am not scared of bias. I want to model that bias. I want to model that bias so it doesn't distort my results. And what I think the bias does here is it informs the results. Uh, in much the same way a Bayesian prior does, or a training data set does. Now it has the, both the pros and cons. We are getting information. We're using information effectively. We're not pretending to be goldfish in a bowl with no understanding what goes on in our system. But obviously, we are, our, sis, our story that comes out at the end is going to be sensitive to that input. But I think that's a good thing. I think it's a way of incorporating an information that we do know about uh, into that. Uh, I, in, and, you know, I can talk about, there's, there's not a question of sensitivity to my input because the entire results depends on that <laughs> completely. If I were to, now, having said that, so it's not, it's like 100% sensitive, you know. Uh, let me go back to that example I have with the Madison data over here. Uh, uh, hi, Marshall. Hey. Um, let me just pull up this tree and, uh, uh, so over here, uh, oops, not here, a complete word example down here. Okay. Over here, the yellow, uh, <clears throat> the yellow, uh, lineages were population lineages that were treated as unknown. And you can see some were assigned to new species. Two populations assigned to a completely new species. And these populations that were unknown uh, in their affinities were assigned to existing species of Lindrophic. Same here, these two were existing populations were assigned to Probata. And now let's look at the blue populations here. These uh, blue populations here are ones we knew. We pretended, well, the other ones we pretended we didn't know. Here we told the program, we know what these species assignments are. If I had gone, and you notice I use Probata here with many, many different populations. And that, without a doubt, influenced the fact that this Probata was lumped versus being split. So, you know, in systematics, we have this lump of split debate. So if you go, and you'll see, for example, in this subtree over here, there's the rate of population splitting, just eyeballing it, is a bit less 
than over here. So there's a lot of population splitting going on over here versus here. So this ratio of species formation versus population splitting is critical. And the information you give it tells the program a lot about that ratio. And so if we were to teach in the machine learning sense, train, delineate based on this subtree and ask it to identify species in this subtree, we are going to get heavily uh, oversplit species because there's very few population, the ratio of speciation is population splitting is a lot less. And vice versa, if you were to take this subtree and, and just infer the rate of um, uh, speciation based on this, speciation completion based on this applied to this, we're going to get overly lumped. So the biggest problem we have with this model is the single speciation completion rate that we're applying to the entire system. There is no doubt that this is a major, major abstraction that is probably going to distort our story. I'm not, I have no problems with models, simple models. It's a problem if it distorts the story. This is just the first step though, right? This is like, think of this as Duke's Cantor. You know, we'll get to GTR plus G plus I later on. Uh, this is just Duke's Cantor right now. And there are many systems for which it's not great, uh, many systems for which it's uh, terrible, but we're hoping there'll be a number of systems for which it might work well enough or at least serve as the next step before we can start incorporating multiple speciation rates. Um, Marshall, did you have a question? I did, I did. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. So I was wondering about the, what seems to be a paradox. It seems, seems like more, more tips tip better for estimating parameters, but but they have to work through the bottleneck of, uh, of the star beast or the PP. Yep. And if you want 100 tips and 100 genes per tip, then neither of those are feasible. Yep. No, this is a major problem. This is a problem with um, BPP uh, and our computational capacity right now. Uh, I'm hoping to do a stage two uh, where we uh, put it all into one, one simultaneous inference package. And that'll solve some of the problems, but introduce its own problem, of course. Uh, so in this line of our worked example, We've come across that problem. Let me see if I can find that. I keep losing the page. I don't know why I close it. Yeah. So this one has, I don't know, let's see, 143 lineages, right? And organized into 12 uh, species. Each of those lineages, that, so it's 143 populations. So this is well beyond the capacity of BPP and Starbeast right now. So this recipe I do here talks about how to solve that problem. Essentially, what we do is we split that tree up into subunits, subtrees. This is not something that can be done automatically or easily. We, we want a sub, we, it's okay if our subunits consist of different species, but we do not want to break up or different populations. We, we don't want to break up a population. We, we want to be able to, they, they have to be cohesive populations within that. And so this scheme, thanks a lot to the wonderful work by Madison, was quite unambiguous. So even though I don't even know how to pronounce line, if uh, I could do it on the subtree, I could break this up into subtrees. And so we break it up into subtrees and we carry up BPP sub individually on each of these independent subtrees. And and the main, we have to be careful that that's a valid thing to do. This is a valid subtree on which we can carry out an independent uh, BPP analysis and the results that come out of it are not invalid because they we needed to have pulled in population from other trees. I'm confident that most systems can make this statement, can come up with this breakdown of that tree, but you do need to know your system to do it. Oh, you need to have someone who's really good and has published really nicely and generously and very well. So someone who does, you can do that. That's just the case over here. And what Delineate provides as part of the software package is a way to collate these results. There's a program called Delineate BPP Sum, 
that uh, you provide all the different BPP subfiles for each of these subtrees. And it will go through it all based on the IMAPs of the BPP and the results of it and put it together into one super tree, essentially, of your populations. So that's the approach we take now in dealing with this computational complexity. Uh, because you're absolutely right, the more data we have, the more we, the better information we have on that critical speciation completion rate, as well as the structure, the tree itself has a lot of useful information in what are possible limitations and which and what are not. But the paradox is we are limited in how big and we can, how big a tree we can. So this has proven quite effective if we can do this step well. And this step has to be with an understanding of that system. You could get away with it uh, by looking at the phylogeny and just pull out subtrees. Danger here would be, say over here I have Cavanoi, they named a different species. If this, this subtree here happens to be the same right fisher population as this subtree over here, this would be an invalid operation. We do not want to break up populations. As long as we can be confident of not breaking up populations, the subtree decomposition is quite straightforward. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, I think I might have my go for it. Um, so you mentioned earlier that the ancestral splits were based off even like a 0.001 detection of a, um, of a gene disruption flow, right? Uh, uh, you mean the population ancestral splits? Yeah. Okay. Any kind of disruption, the gene flow, it, it's called a split, an uh, ancestral split. I was wondering, does that kind of by default make these estimates like an upper bound on the number of species? So the ancestral splits are for the populations. We don't, the speciation splits are actually difficult to see in this tree right here. Uh, these splits are population splits. And this, if I want, there's actually a complex algorithm that takes this tree and gives you a species, a species tree. Uh, and sometimes that species tree does not look like what you'd expect uh, because under this model, we do allow for paraphyletic species, which would scandalize a lot of systematists. Uh, so I'm probably going to be a pariah for even using a model that allows for paraphyletic species. Uh, but uh, yeah, the splits, so the splits you see in this are purely population splits. And what it does is it puts a lower bound in the recency of a possible population split. Because you have a, the, a population cannot have split before the divergence time of those genes. The population has to have split somewhere over here. In this case, it can't have split over here. You can't have genes coalescing after the population splits. So I guess it depends on your orientation of time. If you look at time as age, then it puts a, a lower bound on how, how recent that event could have been. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think I might just be confused at the uh, terminology in this field, but yeah, I think so. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? <laughs>